All right, well, like I said, we're going to be going over the checkover variation tonight, going through some uh, some example games, uh, and we'll get right into it. So for those of you who do not know, the checkover Sicilian starts with e4, c5. So here's our normal Sicilian defense. And normally whites will go knight f3, opting to go into an open variation. Now, the checkover comes from this move d6, so this is not the only move for black that's a Sicilian. There's plenty of other moves. Knight c6, e6, knight f6, g6, all of these are playable. But the checkover comes from d6. After d6, there is pawn d4, which is, again, opening up the position. And almost always, black will take this pawn. And the reason is they're giving up this um, this side pawn, this bishop pawn, for a center pawn. And in exchange, uh, white will normally get a lead in development with knight to d4. However, in the check over, white captures on d4 with the queen. So here, after queen takes, this does invite a few different moves from black. The most obvious one is knight to c6. And the idea behind this is you are attacking the queen with tempo. Now, this is an idea that you see a lot in the Scandinavian with the colors reversed, is when the queen is developed in the center like this, it can get bounced around a bit by black developing their pieces. Um, and we're going to look at a few lines here, but knight c6 is the main line. I want to cover some of the side lines before we get into uh, the main course of the evening. So, after queen takes d4, what other moves are there for black besides knight to c6? There's a couple different options, but the main ones being pawn to a6, bishop to d7, and knight to f6, and each one has their own points. So, uh, with bishop to d7, we'll start with this one, uh, they are preparing to play knight to c6 with a real tempo. If they don't play bishop to d7 first, if they go knight to c6 in the main line, it can be met with bishop to b5, and after the pin is broken, we see a trade of pieces. Now, if black is trying to avoid these exchanges, bishop d7 first makes quite a bit of sense here, as after knight to c6 attacking the queen, you no longer have bishop to b5, so let's make some, uh, some passing move here, and if black plays knight c6, Again, you no longer have bishop to b5, as this knight is no longer pinned. You just lose your queen. So, you should not uh, play that as white. Uh, but the, um, not refutation, but the continuation here for white is pretty familiar to Sicilian players who play the Maruxi bind against the uh, accelerated dragon here. So, we go c4. And you're going to see some uh, natural development from both sides here. Knight to c6 attacking the queen. And really the only odd looking move here is queen to d2. Now, this move was a little confusing to me at first as I was looking through my databases. Because you're blocking the bishop, you're blocking squares that your knights can go to. But uh, eventually it will start to make some sense. Normally... Uh, in these types of setups, white is not trying to go bishop to e3 like a normal Maroxi. Uh, a lot of the time we're going to see white play pawn to b3 and put the bishop on b2. And the reason this is, is because with this pawn on d6, an easy way for uh, black to develop their bishop is to go g6 and bishop g7. So it would be nice for white if they can get some opposition on this diagonal. So here, um, after queen to d2, there's two main options by black here. We will start with knight to f6, as I believe this is the most played move. Uh, and here we're going to follow a bit of the game Tirandkov versus Efimenko from Alushta 2002. Uh, so knight to c3, g6, pawn to h3, stopping any possible uh, pieces coming to g4. Bishop to g7, bishop to d3, castle, castle, and queen a5. So queen a5 is going to be another common move we see here uh, from black. 
and now we get queen to e2. So queen to e2 has a couple purposes here. First off, um, with this queen being protected by the knight, you don't really have any um, in between moves like knight to d5 trying to take on e7. Because if knight d5, uh, you can you can take the queen. If you take on e7, the knight takes. Or uh, you know, there, there's no real attack here uh, with the knight on c6. So queen to e2 is looking to break this kind of, not really a pin because the queens are equal, but we'd rather keep our queen and build our chances for later and try and make the claim that black's queen is misplaced here on the queen side. Black will normally play a6 here and then bishop d2 follows. So this is one of those situations where with the queen on a5 it makes sense to put the bishop on d2. Now moves like knight d5 are again a bit more attractive but uh, it's not like you're going to be winning on e7, again, knight on c6. Um, and in this particular game, black transferred the queen to the king side, um, and then white uh, just tries to improve the queen by getting on to uh, open squares. And then rather than allow queen to g5, forcing a queen trade, black goes back to c5, and they would rather have a trade on this side of the board try and make the pawn structure a bit more symmetrical, try and get rid of this uh, asymmetry. So we see a queen trade, bishop to e3 hitting the pawn, pawn to b6 defending, and I think here I can I can call it here, uh, white is going to be uh, better here because of the pawn structure. Again, this, uh, this c4 and e4 is very strong against a lot of these, um, I guess, accelerated dragon type setups. Um, but it's not like it's going to be an easy win. White's still going to have to maneuver pieces and work for the win. But it's going to be very hard for black to advance and break through. Meanwhile, white is always threatening moves like e5, which might tickle black's pieces into poor positions later. Um, which is actually what happened in this game. But uh, I'm going to switch over to one of our other variations here because I feel this is where it starts to branch off is uh, rather than knight to f6 where it is hitting the pawn um, and then followed by knight c3 black can also opt to go g6 right away and this is just trying to get this uh, set up as fast as possible now rather than rush knight to c3 yes is going to be the move you play later but we're going to play bishop e2 first trying to castle as soon as possible and after bishop g7 we see white castle. Uh, knight to f6 attacking the pawn, and now we get knight to c3, castles from black, and now with white to move here in this position, one common idea you will see is rook to b1, and this move was seen in the game Anand Kasparov in Moscow 1995. And here, rook b1, the idea is you're getting ready to push your pawn either all the way up to b4 or really just breaking any kind of problems you may have after b3 and this knight moves. This pin on the knight can be rather strong. So you just play rook to b1 uh, supporting both of those ideas, getting ready to play b3 in Fianchetto or um, getting ready to play b4 and push it all the way up the board. We see black play pawn to a6 in this game, and white decides to settle on the pawn b3 idea, getting ready to fianchetto. And this is also really nice that the rook is on b1, because not only does it break this um, this potential pin, um, but whenever this bishop goes to b2, it's actually overprotected, and our queen can move around in the future. Um, so we can have our queen as an attacking piece while our rook defends the bishop. Uh, so queen a5 here, again we see this kind of, um, again not a pin, but um, if you move the knight there will be a queen trade. Um, and bishop to b2, this is just over defending the knight, getting ready to move the queen in the future. You see rook f to c8, this is a very common move you'll see in a lot of dragons. Rook f to d1, and bishop to g4. Now, uh, again, we'll see some more standard moves like queen to e3 and knight d7. Knight d7 is going to be, um, I guess d7 is going to be the square that this knight goes to the most. And it's really just to open up the bishop and get control on e5 and c5. Um, Sandro Shock is in the chat with a question about the bishop d7 line. 
um, after g6, queen d2, and then something to h6. I can't tell if it's bishop to h6 or if it's pawn, because uh, lh6 uh, isn't algebraic uh, notation that I'm familiar with. Um, but we'll get into it. Uh, if you can clarify that last move, I'll, I'll look into it. Um, but again, knight d7 is going to be the idea opening up the position and this knight getting ready to go to either e5 or c5. But normally, I think it goes to e5 uh, just because you want to keep as few pieces on the c file as possible as uh, black would really like to open that up one day. Uh, so in this game, you see something like knight to d5, you see a trade of bishops, bishop take on f3, bishop take on f3, and e6, and uh, knight c3. And here is where I'm going to stop going through the game, because I feel like this is where it starts turning into the middle game. And uh, here, it was a uh, pretty uh, rough ending for uh, Kasparov after this game. Uh, Anand just kind of kind of blew him out of the water over the next few moves. Um, okay, so Sandro Schock said after bishop to d7, after c4, g6, and queen d2, uh, something to h6. Uh, an idea for black to exchange the dark square bishop. So bishop h6, I'm assuming here. Um, this could be an idea, but the next question is if queen to d2 is the best move in this move order. Uh, I don't think I covered g6, but uh, here actually after g6, uh, it just hangs the rook. Um, silly me to just miss it. But um, yeah, you can't, uh, you can't just play g6 this early, that is why black plays something like knight c6 first and then after queen d2 if you go g6 this is that other line we were just looking at bishop to e2 bishop to g7 now if you go bishop h6 trying to trade the bishops uh i, I just want to say i do not think this is a a good move at all um trying to trade off the dark square bishops because with this fianchetto structure if you trade off this bishop you're going to have a lot of holes on the dark squares in your position and if you know anything about the Sicilian dragon, um, that piece is, is your best your best minor piece, sometimes even being worth up to a rook. This um, bishop on the long diagonal is super strong. I don't know why you would go out of your way to try and trade off the pieces. Because here after something like just queen c2, and if you go through with your plan and knight f6, um, knight c3 just to defend the pawn, I... I don't know what you've gained out of this. I don't know why it's so important to trade off the dark square bishops. But uh, it's still good you brought it up as as an idea. So that kind of covers this um, knight c6 idea after the, the queen moves. We covered g6 here. Um, and this is really the, the main ideas of bishop d7. It's going to resemble an accelerated dragon uh, with the Maroxi bind. Other than bishop d7, I did say we had a couple other moves here. I'm going to look at knight f6 now, and this avoids exchanges and continues to develop. So, again, if you go knight c6, just bishop b5, and you're exchanging at least one set of minor pieces, these sidelines are what black is going to be looking at in order to try and avoid exchanges. You want to try and keep as many pieces on the board to retain maximum chances. But here after knight f6, uh, I think white is just going to be fine with knight to c3 defending the pawn. You can try c4 in this position, but um, I think there's a, a weird move order thing where um, the queen's placement is going to be rather odd. So the line I have here is knight to c6 attacking the queen, and you no longer have queen to d2 as that would hang the e4 pawn. So you have to go queen e3. And after queen e3, black just continues with their normal development. Again, we see h3 to stop any pieces coming to g4. And after bishop d7, sorry, g7, knight c3 castles bishop e2, black has queen to b6, offering a queen trade. And this is because the queen had to go to e3 to defend the pawn rather than go to d2. Black can offer this trade of queens. And 
Um, while taking may look good at first because you're doubling the pawns, after bishop e3 and knight d7, uh, white's queenside starts to look a little unstable as the bishop is staring down the diagonal, this rook is looking at a2, knight is ready to hop into b4. I don't think that... Um, that this is the best continuation for white just because I, I think the queen side is a little dubious here. So rather than trade queens, you should just castle. And then after knight d7, um, I, I think that uh, this position is just fine for black. They have, excuse me, they have the queen trade whenever uh, they want. Um, and you really don't get that time to develop on the queen side like you would like to. Um, mainly, uh, this is all just coming from that pressure on e4, so uh, rather than spend the time to play c4 and then get hit by the knight right away and you're falling behind in time, you want to play knight to c3, that way after knight to c6, well this here transposes into the main line after bishop to b5, uh, bishop d7 takes takes, this is a main line here. Um, so we're probably not going to see knight c6 here actually on the queen. Um, if black is playing this sideline, they're more likely to play something like pawn to a6 um, Because if you're going to transpose to the main line, why not just play the main line? Uh, and after a6, white has this kind of breaking, freeing move pawn to e5 So this is hitting the d-pawn and the knight, and after knight to c6 hitting both There's queen to a4 Now this is kind of um it's not really a pawn sacrifice, it looks like you're giving up the pawn, but the queen is actually pinning the knight. So here, uh, I see someone in the chat asking what's wrong with e5. Uh, if you're asking what's wrong with e5 for white, I don't think this is wrong. Uh, I just went into this line saying I think this is the best continuation. If you're asking why not e5 for black here, instead of a6, um, here you develop with tempo and I don't know just retreat the queen to safety but uh, I'm not sure what side you're asking for um, but okay e5 for white just kind of hitting black's position the queen gets hit you pin the knight again this pawn is not uh, actually hanging because after the pawn takes there is actually knight e5 because this knight is pinned cannot move so, uh, yeah, okay, uh, just some clarification for the e5 move just a second ago. It was for black. Uh, okay, wins more space for black. We'll, we'll get into it later. Let's try and stick, uh, for the comments in the chat, let's try and stick to the line that uh, I'm currently on because I don't want to keep jumping back and forth. Um, at the end, I, I do ask for questions. Uh, if we don't touch your line, we can answer it then. Um, but okay, uh, after knight e5, bishop d7 is a must because you need to break the pin, and here white just wins the bishop pair after knight d7 and queen d7. Now bishop b5 is a move I would expect from the 1200 to 1500 crowd. They're saying, hey, I'm trying to attack you, and look, you cannot take because if you take, I win your rook, but this move is really... Um, not accomplishing much for white. There's actually this move rook to c8, defending the knight again, and after this, I mean, you're not going to benefit from giving up the bishop pair you just won. Uh, you're best just to go bishop to e2, and you've kind of wasted this time. It really let black play rook to c8 for free, uh, which is a move they would like to play anyway. So I do not recommend going bishop to b5, um, no matter how creative it looks, I, I'm going to recommend just bishop to d2. And it's important it's bishop to d2 instead of bishop to e3. Bishop to e3 has been played almost as much in this position, but the key difference is um, while this looks like more of a passive square, you retain the option to castle, which is probably going to be more important than um, however much more active your bishop is going to be on e3 because you can castle and then play bishop e3 you can't go bishop e3 and castle with the queen on d7 so that is why uh, bishop d2 instead of bishop e3 in this position here uh, 
So I'm saying Pleeper should be 5 for this psychological advantage, I guess. But um, I don't recommend it. We see castles, uh, queen d4, and now we see bishop e3. So this uh, kind of improving idea that I just mentioned. And the game here that you want to check out for this line is Movsevzian uh, versus Duda in Bans uh, Banska Stiavnica. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. But uh, Movsevzian Duda 2016. Um, both 26... Uh, 100 level players, strong 2600s, uh, playing this position out. You see a queen trade, knight d5, bishop c5, um, a couple bishop trades here, offering to trade the knights, and you get this very interesting uh, bishop and knight end game here. Uh, and this game ended with white winning, but uh, that was. Uh, more due to technique later on, not that this position is just winning for white. But I would highly recommend checking that game out. Okay, um, other than bishop d2, I don't think there's any other serious tries. Again, bishop e3 has been played almost as much, but you don't get a just castle on the queen side. Um... I think someone was just saying after queen to d4 here, you should take the queen. But I don't see why white should take the time to uh, go out of their way and capture the queen. Yes, they can take, and knight takes back, and bishop d3 is a fine move. But uh, bishop to e3 with the tempo while you have it. And it's not like your position's garbage after your knight's on a4. You're using this knight on a4 to support a trade of dark squared bishops, which is probably going to benefit white more than black, as white will still have a bishop on the board. And theoretically, this bishop should be a really good minor piece for black, as it is on the opposite color of these uh, pawns. So I would say go bishop e3 first and get the tempo while you can. And then after the trade, you're, you'll be doing fine. Okay, um, other than d takes e5, another move that has been played um, quite a lot actually at uh, a higher level has been knight to g4. Your knight is attacked, you go knight to g4. And it looks like you can take it with the queen, but you don't want to forget these pieces on the back rank can still influence the position. And this is where the other idea of e5 comes in, is that you can capture on e6, and here the best move is capture with queen. You don't want to take with pawn because this pawn being isolated will become a target in the future. So just take with queen, retain your pawn structure's flexibility. And now after h3, uh, you don't want uh, white to be having any kind of uh, play here on the king side. You just kick the knight away. Knight goes to e5, you see a trade on e5, and while this check looks scary, just bishop to e2 and your problems are no more. Bishop f5 is most played here, uh, and the idea is basically if white plays a normal move like castles, they'll play e6 and develop naturally. Um, but here is a, an instance where white can play pawn to g4 and be completely fine. The bishop goes back to d7. Bishop to e3, you no longer want to castle on the king side because you've extended these pawns. You want to castle queen side and get this rook on the open file. So now after e6, castles queen side, this position um, is better for white. I can say that confidently. Uh, you have a bishop pair that is doing a pretty good job at watching the queen side. Your knight is uh, watching over the center. You already have a rook on an open file, and black is struggling to uh, get this bishop out in castle at the same pace that um, that white has been developing. Uh, sorry, I did not mean to make that move there. Um, but yeah, I also wanted to point that out with knight g4. This is another idea. White can just remember, play pawn g4 later. Excuse me. Okay. So let's go back and we will see, um, that kind of covers knight to f6 here. Now we're going to look at the, the last little sideline, pawn to a6. And pawn to a6 also has this idea of stopping um, exchanges. This move stops bishop to b5, so knight c6 can come with tempo. 
Uh, now, with a6, it is a bit of a slower move. It's not developing any pieces, and white already has two pieces developed. So here, you actually do have the time to continue this Maroxy bind type position with c4, and you're not going to run into like huge problems like you would with knight f6, because with knight f6, uh, it added pressure to your position immediately. a6 is just... Um, saying, okay, I don't want you doing this, but you're not putting extra pressure on the position. So you do have the time for c4 here. And now black is most likely to play knight to c6. Okay, your queen is attacked, what should you do? Well, here, um, I want to double check queen d2. Queen d2 is still fine here, and you can continue with the ideas that we had earlier. But uh, the game I had here... Um, I didn't recommend Queen D2 because there was a game between Carlson and Jones, Gawain Jones, uh, London 2012, which I thought was pretty recent. Uh, Magnus was already 2850 at this time, uh, and he played Queen to E3, and I really just suggested this line because uh, Magnus played it, it can't be bad. Um, and it's an easy game to, uh, for you guys to look up if you want to look into deeper. Uh, but here, black continues with this dragon-type setup. It's more of like a dragon dwarf now, because a6 has been played, and white gets a, a Maroxy setup here. We see h3, bishop g7, bishop e2, knight f6, knight c3. Hopefully these moves are looking pretty natural by now. Castle, castle, knight d7, and rook to b1. Again, trying to go for this b4 idea. And here, uh, again, b3 and, and fianchetto is fine, but I think here in this specific position, you're going to be trying to go for this um, pawn b4 idea a little bit more, as if they play a5 trying to stop this, it opens up the uh, b5 square for the knight. Now, you don't necessarily want to go there right away. You can play b3 first, but uh, this b5 square does become an outpost. Uh, and then here, something like knight c5, bishop b2. Um, and then here, Gawain Jones decided to play f5. But uh, I, I think I'm just going to leave it here. And if you want to see what happens after f5, definitely go check out that game. Uh, again, that game is Carlson Jones, uh, London 2012. Uh, and that that kind of covers this a6 idea. There hasn't really been any deviation from it. Um, I guess the other idea is that after a6, you can still play knight c3, and this is actually the most played move. But the database stats actually show that this does not score too well for white. Black actually scores much better here after knight to c3. Um, I'm not really sure why that is, as it seems the moves are pretty consistent with what white normally plays, but here um, we do see this e5 idea that someone in the chat was uh, trying to bring up earlier, was um, they can try e5, and they made the claim that this, this gains more space for black, which I do agree with, it does gain them more space, but this also runs into the same problem that you run into in the Nidorf with e5 is that this d6 pawn actually becomes a huge weakness um, that white can pile up on later. So obviously they can't do anything about it now, but after they save the queen and develop further, they're going to have a target um, that they can pile up on for pretty much the entire game. So um, that, that is also true for e5 in the other line that it was being suggested for is that anytime black plays e5 you're going to continue this um, standard theoretical plan of piling up on d6 and trying to do something about it with perfect play black will be able to hold um, it's not like d6 you play e5 and d6 is for sure falling but that's where white is going to be piling up the pressure and uh, I guess some further moves here bishop e3 knight a5 attacking the queen again Queen to b6, and queen takes, bishop takes, knight c6. This position is um, fairly balanced. I think uh, white white does get a bit of an upper hand after castles. Again, just putting on the pressure early, but no serious winning advantage here. Black still has normal developing moves like rook c8, or uh, I guess uh, if you try bishop to e7, this is where it can go wrong, because bishop c7 
and there there's really no great way to protect d6 which is why you see rook c8 first um but then you'll see moves like bishop e7 and castle like normal uh so that is the other alternative that white has is knight to c3 but i personally don't like this line as it seems that uh after black bounces uh or sorry uh <laughs> tempos the queen um I mean, one, two, three, four queen moves until it's traded off. You're investing a lot of moves into this piece. Now, your position is ahead in development, so it's not like it's completely bad. I mean, people play this line for a reason, but that's just why I personally wouldn't play this line, is I feel like you're giving up too much time with the queen. Uh, and that covers pretty much a6. Okay. So now we've covered all of these side lines for black. Now let's get into the main line. The main line, knight c6 attacking the queen right away. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, the main move is bishop to b5. There are two alternatives here that you do see um, at higher levels. You see queen to a4 and queen to e3. We'll cover queen to a4 as it's a little bit more dubious. Because black gets a knight f6, and after knight c3 protecting bishop d7, um, first, the, the database uh, statistics that I have show that white has had particularly poor results after this move. And I think it takes a lot of courage to play this position when your queen does not have many squares. This uh, bishop move does hit the queen, and again, you're going to... You're going to end up be, uh, making a lot of moves with the queen that I particularly am not a fan of. But other than uh, queen to a4, there is queen to e3, which uh, I've actually seen quite a bit. Um, I have a couple opponents who play the check over against me at the chess club during tournaments, and uh, I think I, I personally see queen e3 more than I see bishop to b5. Um, but knight f6, bishop to e2, g6, all this normal developing moves shouldn't be a problem for either side. The key difference in this position versus the others is that white has not had the time to put in c4. So black may have the opportunity to do a little bit more stuff on the queen side here. See uh, rook to d1, knight d7, again this knight maneuver to open up the bishop. This also stops bishop to d2 from being played as bishop takes b2 and then the rook. So knight c3, pawn to b6, rook b1, and bishop to b7. And I'm going to cut the analysis of this line here. Um, but I should also mention the name of this system with queen e3. I forgot to mention it earlier. It is known as the Hare Krishna system as uh, Grandmaster Hare Krishna has been bringing this to light recently. And uh, there was actually a game played this year on Lee Chess between Hare Krishna and um, actually the 2021 World Championship candidate, Jan Nepomnishi. So uh, definitely check out these games. These are being played at the very top level between 27 and 2800s. <clears throat> Um, let's see, we're getting someone in the chat saying, in this line you prefer to queenside castle? I don't know how I feel about that. How are you actually going to do that? Because all these moves, I guess, after queen e3, why would you try and queenside castle if it takes three moves uh, versus two moves on the king side? Um, so if you'd like to follow up your idea, go right ahead. Um... But you're, you're talking about preferring the queenside castle and damage the kingside pawn structure when realistically it takes a lot of time to do that. This is not your standard dragon where you can just develop normally and just shove the h pawn down the board. Because you're going to have to play moves like knight c3, bishop d2, castles, queenside, and then not only that, you're going to have to try and move this knight out of the way so you can get extra power from the f and g pawns. So if you would like to give me specific moves of how you're going to make this work, I'll be very interested, we'll go over it, but I don't think white has the time to do all these things you're hoping for. Um, okay, so that is the Hare Krishna system, which is uh, rising in popularity for sure. The main line through the test of time, though, has been bishop to b5, and this is just 
pinning the knight, stopping it from attacking the queen. Now here, um, pretty much a, a not mandatory move. I mean, queen c7, I guess, is a sideline, but bishop d7 is definitely the most principal. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, so they're responding about their uh, system in the uh, Hare Krishna line, and they're just asking, what is the threat for black? Black doesn't need to make threats. Um, you know, they just develop normally. It's too early in the game to say that there's big threats. But um, if you're playing chess looking for a threat on every single move, you're going to be missing a lot of the positional features as well. But, uh, I mean, if the best defense to your idea is what is their threat, um, I'm sorry, that, that is not a strong enough argument for me. Back to the main line. Um, White does exchange here. They give up the bishop pair um, in order to leave the queen in the center. Now, a lot of times at scholastic tournaments, I have seen um, players end up playing um, g6 soon, so like knight c3. Uh, and unfortunately, at my very first ever tournament, I ended up playing g6 in this position and hung a rook. Please do not play g6 and hang a rook here. Um, g6 is just uh, not good. Not good enough. So, uh, after knight c3, you play knight f6, closing off this diagonal. Now g6 is a possibility. Uh, and bishop to g5. So bishop to g5, while it's not a pin, does set yourself up for one. e6 is a, the main line here. Uh, if they try and go g6, then this trade is good for white, as this pawn is now isolated. Uh, so they should go e6 if they're trying to develop the dark square bishop. And this is just a pretty healthy place to put the bishop if you're trying to castle queenside. So pawn e6 here and castles. And now we see that d6 is a bit of a weakness again. And we see bishop to e7. Now this is another kind of branching point for the check over. There's a couple sidelines that white has. We're going to be looking at the main move rook h to e1. Queen to d3 has a couple moves I'll show. And then um, it looks like bishop to d2 has been played. But I, I'm not a big fan of bishop to d2 because you're undeveloping. Um, and then the other move in this position, um, one of the first games I looked at when I was preparing this is bishop takes f6. And this was seen in fine gold Esserman in 2012 or 2013 um, where after the bishop takes back black sacrifices this pawn um, you're not really sacrificing the pawn as after bishop c3 bc3 bishop takes e4 um, but this end game is rather interesting for both sides something like knight e5 um, and they don't want to take on g2 as rook g1 enters the position but uh, that is also uh, a very interesting game to look at, and Ben Feingold actually has his commentary on his own YouTube channel over that game. But that is a very rare sideline, only played about 20, 25 times. Um, someone's asking if white can play e5 before castling here. So bishop g5, e6, and then rather than castle, play e5 here. Um, that's a good question. I think if my opponent played e5, I, I would not be against this as I can take. You have to do something for your queen. If you go queen e5, you can no longer castle queenside. So I'm not too worried about this. And bishop d6 comes with tempo on the queen right away. Um, and if you trade queens, I'm very happy taking with the rook because now my rook's on an open file. I didn't have to do anything. Um, if knight e5 getting your pawn back, uh, bishop g2 looks to be the case. So, uh, at least from black's point of view, I wouldn't have any problem with white playing this as I can just take. And then I guess if you're playing this as white, you have to take on e5 with the queen. But uh, I don't like the idea of black getting this file um, after any of these variations. So I would stay away from e5 and see if you can time it, see if there's a, a better time to play it later on. Um, 
just castle first, build up this pressure on, on the D file. Maybe then E5 can be more appropriate as you have another attacker on the D file. But um, as any chess game, it's all subject to circumstance. Um, and here, bishop e7, and let's see, one move here that has been played is queen to d3, uh, and here queen to a5 is a common move where it is attacking the bishop on g5, it is defended by the knight though, but after something like h4, h6, and then uh, bishop takes is completely fine here, um, black uh, is not actually hanging this pawn as something like a, oh what is it, bishop c3, ruining the king side structure. I was looking also at rook d8 isn't too terrible for black here. Um, so you can take if you want, but uh, that's kind of with this uh, queen d3 you're going to be looking at trading. And going from there you're going to have two knights against two bishops, which you can play that if you like your knights I guess. Uh, but I think I, I like just the main move here, rook h to e1. This here is the main line. Uh, see more comments about the e5 move. Yeah, yeah, no, it's all good. Um, but okay, rook h to e1 here as the main move. And black really should castle here. Um, castle, get the king to safety, getting ready to bring your rook to the center. And here after castles, the most played move is king to b1. Uh, after king to b1, there's two options for black. There is queen to a5 and there is h6. We'll look at queen to a5 real quick as this is less played. But after queen to a5, there's this move queen to d2, which I think is very interesting as uh, after queen d2, there is a threat of knight d5 where after knight d5 you're going to take on e7 and black is going to lose their bishop pair and let's say that um okay black plays some passing move knight d5 and if they try to trade queens is losing on the spot after knight e7 so they have to play something like um like queen to uh d8 uh if they play some random move here but because of this threat Queen a6 has been the main move, um, just because knight d5 is a pretty strong threat with the queen undefended. This is why um, uh, it's also important to make note of if your opponent has a knight on c6 or not, um, because this knight d5 idea is uh, apparent not just in this Sicilian variation, but in, in a lot of others as well, um, in the Maroxi bind particularly. But okay, queen a6... Knight d4, bringing the knight to the center, hitting the bishop, getting ready to play f3. Rook f2 c8, just a natural developing move. f3 and bishop to e8, opening up the file for the rook. And now after g4, rook c4, h4, all these are fine moves. The game here is um, Zagalko versus Vorobiov in Party Bice 2006. That is the game here. Um that I followed, but I think here after h4 you start to run into more standard Sicilian themes of um, pushing on the king side, stopping white on the queen side, and this is what um, our friend Fetty in the chat was hoping for in some other lines. But here, after queen a5, this is a pretty good plan as it starts to mirror more regular open Sicilians because you do get to play knight d4 in time. Uh, all because you get this kind of tempo with this knight d5 threat. Other than queen a5, the main move here is h6. And after h6, it's attacking the bishop. You have to do something about this bishop. Um, and here's one of the positions where you can bring it back. So bishop h4. You don't really want to make this trade here as bishop f6 tempos the queen. You can take on d6 if you want, but black is not obligated to take back. They can go queen b6, and now they're already having threats to win the knight. They're ready to bring their rooks into the center. So um, here, while this is possible, it is playable, I don't think I recommend this. I think it gives black a little bit more chances for counterplay than I am comfortable with. So um, after h6, just bring the bishop back to h4. Um, you don't want to uh, take and allow the bishop to be staring at the king's side. 
And here, Rook E8 has been played many a time. Um, really, uh, I don't completely understand this move. Uh, I know that this exists in the Dragon as well, this Rook E8 move. Um, but I, I honestly cannot tell you the purpose of this move. I'm assuming it's just to uh, help strengthen your, your center in the near future. Bishop to g3 has been played. Um, I think h3 is also a recommendation here, but I think um, bishop g3, I'm just going to recommend that to uh, keep things simple. You're attacking d6, and uh, the game this is from is actually um, following Svidler Kasparov in 1999. So another uh, game with strong players. And here, Kasparov ended up playing d5, which is a type of pawn sacrifice. Now, it might not seem apparent right away that this is a sacrifice. Um, here, after d5, um, let's talk about how this is a sacrifice. You go with e5 attacking the knight, and after knight e4, you trade. Now, here in the game, this is where um, this fiddler... He didn't mess up here, but after trading on d8, um, black really doesn't have any problems here. They have the bishop pair, which in this scenario is, is kind of worth giving up this pawn, um, which isn't even really given up right away. Again, it's just this e4 pawn for black is um, uh, just really weak. They can never play f5. And white really is just waiting for the right time to take on e4. They can't go right away because um, bishop c6 might be a problem. The knight on d4 kind of helps with that. But, uh, I mean, if you take bishop c6 and you can't take on c6 because you hang your rook on d1. So, uh, and the problem with allowing bishop to c6 is that it skewers to get the pawn on g2. So you're not really winning this pawn. You're just got to play it slow, patient, wait to take at the right time. And, uh... In the games, Fiddler chose King C2. But enough of that game. Uh, I have my recommendation, Queen to E3. And this move, I think, is slightly better. Um, you get a tempo on their queen, and after Queen A5, you go Knight to D2. And the idea here is now this pawn looks like it's actually falling. Um, this knight is going to take. If they take with the bishop, you're good to take back with the queen. Um, and this is probably how I would continue, but here, engines are giving triple zeros. Uh, I think it's unclear who is better, because white is going to go up this pawn. In turn, black has the bishop pair, and rather easy development. So I think this is a position that I, I would love to see played out. Um, but I, I, uh... I don't see it happening anytime in the immediate future, as I don't think many people are playing the check over variation now. But I think everyone's kind of gravitating toward this. Uh, what was it the the Hari Krishna system? Uh, yeah, Hari Krishna system is uh, what people are starting to gravitate towards. But this is what I would like to see played out one day, and uh, we'll see if it ever happens. But that is. All of the, the, the games, the lines, the theory that I have put together for you guys, hopefully you guys found this helpful. I know that finding theory for the check over can be uh, pretty difficult. Like I said, it's pretty difficult for me. Um, my copy of the MCO, I couldn't even find this opening in there. Um, so again, hopefully this helps. If there's any questions on specific lines, this time is for you. We have five minutes before the uh, end of our scheduled time here. So if anybody has any other questions on any specific lines and positions, now's your time. Put it in the chat. Uh, okay. Let's see. Fatty's asking more questions. What if he plays g6? So in this main line, what if they try g6? Um, when would they be playing g6 is my question. Because if you play e6, you have to go bishop e7. Otherwise, uh, if you try playing g6 after, the knight is going to hang, or you're, you're going to have some big weaknesses on the king side. So if you try g6 right away, I also covered this already, is uh, the bishop takes, and 
while these doubled pawns aren't horrible for black, you can play with this. Um, you have a decision to make. If you go bishop g7, which makes a lot of sense, d6 is pretty weak. Uh, and I'm not sure um, how good it is for black to try and mix these ideas. Um, okay, someone's suggesting to do the English. Another person suggesting to do the Traxler. I'm not taking opening suggestions at this current point in time. If you have an opening you want to see, um, please come back to the video once it's published to YouTube and put it in the comments. Not gonna lie, I forget your guys' suggestions if it's just in the chat like this. I want to make sure that I can um, uh, get to them, make sure I have them. So in the comments section after this video is published is the best place to put your opening suggestions. Ah, okay. Clarification. Uh, they were saying after they kick the bishop with h6, why don't they play g5? Well, in this specific scenario, um, without doing any any calculation into it, um, g5 looks rather weakening to me because the king has already castled. If the king had not castled, I think this is uh, more playable. But because the king has already castled, I'm trying to already figure out why moves like knight g5 or bishop g5 um, wouldn't work here. But uh, aside from those sacrifices, I think I can just go bishop g3, hit d6 again, and then claim that your king side is overextended in the long run. Um, I don't know what you play here. I guess you can try and play, excuse me, e5 and try and shut down this diagonal. Um, but the queen comes to e3, and now knight g5, queen g5 is trying to at least secure a draw, I think. Um, knight d5 is also coming. So I think the, the problem with g5 is you're just overextending, and g5 becomes a target and can be the subject of possible sacrifices. That's not a guarantee, but that is my best guess as to why g5 is not good. And then uh, just to clear or uh, back that claim up, I also do have Stockfish 13 running, uh, and it's saying after Bishop G3 the position is plus one and a half. So um, just overextending the pawns in front of the king, general uh, is a general no no. You don't want to be pushing the pawns in front of your king that far forward. But it was a good question. Any other questions about the check over or lines that come from? Got about another minute here. So, got time for one more question if anyone has them. Hey, Fetty, the, the pleasure's all mine. I love giving these lectures for you guys. You guys have been very interactive in the chat with me. It makes it a great pleasure. Um, and you do have a lot of great questions. Um, I know we were kind of button heads there a little bit about some some ways black can handle the position or, or white. Um, but, I mean, that's that's the beauty of chess. People can have different opinions on it. Um, and, and really, that's what I mean. What we do in tournaments is opinions on how each side should handle the position. Uh, so if I came off too strong, I'm sorry. But uh, I do want to say uh, you had a lot of good questions, a lot of good examples to bring up. So big shout-out to Fetty Hassin there. All right. Well, it is 7.30, so we're going to wrap things up here on YouTube. We'll get this video sent to Ben for editing. And uh, like I said, if you have different openings you want to see, wait until the video is published to YouTube for replay. Drop it in the comment section there. I always check it out a couple days after the video to see what you guys are wanting me to, to show you guys. Um, but now we're going to, like I said, end it on YouTube. We're going to switch over to Twitch where we're going to continue our Winner's Circle series where we're following the games of Vasily Smyslov in the 1953 Candidates. We're covering rounds 14, 15, and 16 today, and let me tell you, there is a juicy game tonight. I know last week was kind of boring with it, but uh, hop on over to our Twitch, twitch.tv slash St. Louis Chess Club, and we'll see you there. Thanks for stopping by.